Yeah, you know, one time when I was in the army, I went to Afghanistan and I forgot my M16. Duck and hide, duck and hide. Oh, no, without your sword. Okay. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Now, if you got a Bible, I'm going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, yeah. well, I don't need a microphone. Do I back there? You can hear me good, Rick? I do need one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> turn me up a little bit back there. There we go. Can you hear me, Rick? Rick. All right. So we're going to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to begin in verse 3. For the time will come when sound doctrine will be intolerable, causing hindrances on your way of life. But I will provide for you new teachers so that your salvation will not be hindered by your conviction. <laughs> you will turn away from hearing old myths and turn to the truths you so desire. Amen? Yeah. Turn me up a little more. There we go. All right, that way you gotta yell. The most important thing that you must do in your own personal walk is to grow closer and closer to God continually. Anybody disagree? We have to grow closer and closer to God. The, the longer we go, we have to continue growing closer to God. See, in the world, there's many people that will try to deter you from God. There's many principalities, many spirits that are going to try to deter you from the God who wants to save you and love you and be with you forevermore. But... Because we believe that there's a God, we have to believe that God has an enemy because the Bible says so. That enemy does not want you in relationship or in reconciliation with God. And so he also has an army just as God has an army. <coughs> so this growing closer and closer with God as we walk is not something that comes easily the way I believe that many in church today think that it will be. To be honest with you, in the American church today, many people believe that because I go to Sunday Mass or because I go to church on Sunday, that I'm constantly growing with God. But listen, if you're at church for one hour on Sunday, where are you the rest of the week? You're in a world where there's a different ruler. There's a different principality. There's a different spirit working in that world. And so if you're spending six and a half days out of a week in the world and only half a day in church, how are you growing stronger? The truth is many people come to church and they hear a 45-minute hour sermon, or if you go to Heaven's Highway, you hear a two-hour sermon. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that's what you want to live all week off of. You believe you're getting fed enough by a pastor, by a, a man. You believe you're getting fed enough to survive the rest of the week without feeding on, on the word of God, on the bread of life. Paul wrote in many letters over and over, he says things like, I do not want you to be deceived. There are those out there who would deceive you. There are, there, are, there are those out there who would lead you astray. Paul warned of these things over and over. And listen, if it was going on in Paul's days, you can bet your bottom dollar it's going on even more so today as we reach the end of days. Then There's people who are being led astray continually. People that are consistently being deceived. My question to you today is how will you know? How do you know you're not one of them? How will you know the spirit that wants to deceive you? How will you know the false teachings that are just abundant out there? Believe me, if you want something taught to you, if it's just a desire in your heart, go ahead, you'll find it. It's out there. Anything you want to hear, anything your itching ears want to hear, it's out there. How will you know? By knowing the Bible. What's that? By knowing the Bible. That is probably the smartest answer I could have heard. That is. That's what my mom always says. Absolutely, discernment. So this is what I want to give you guys today. We have to find out for sure. This is not a game, you guys. 
We have to know for sure that we are not being deceived. We have to know for sure that we are standing on the truth of God's word. That we are in the Holy Spirit and not a deceiving spirit. That we are in a righteous path and not a, a broad path that leads to a place that too many are going. The thing is, it's not as easy to recognize as you might think it would be. Oh, no, no. Listen, a false teacher is not going to let you know he's a false teacher. Okay? A false prophet is not going to come up. Before you start telling you, I want you to know I'm a false prophet, so I'm going to try to deceive you as best as I can. All right? He doesn't wear a stamp or a sign on his head. All right? Even a false teaching is not going to come straight out somewhere, but not every false teacher is going to come straight out and say, Jesus is not the Son of God. <laughs> they are not making it that he listens to me now the enemy has been doing his job far longer than you've been doing yours he's been around far longer than you've been around he knows how to deceive matter of fact the bible says he will deceive even the elect if possible that's that's us, that's us okay so it's not going to be as easy as you might think it's going to be you really have to be aware and on the lookout for these false teachings What a false teacher can do, one of the many things they can do is they can take the word of God, twist the word here or there, spin it around a little bit, and then read it to you without you even realizing they just read you a big fat line. You want me to prove it to you? I already did. That passage I read to you is nowhere in the Bible. But I heard everybody, amen, amen. But that wasn't even God's word. As a matter of fact, the passage I just read to you is the opposite of what the Bible actually says. Listen to what I told you. I said, for the time will come when sound doctrine will be intolerable. I said, causing hindrances on your way of life. That's what the world wants to hear. That the, the sound doctrine is actually intolerable and it hinders your way of life. That's what deceivers will teach you. They will tell you things like, well, God doesn't want you to be unhappy. God wants you to live the way you want to live. God wants you to just be happy. That's all he has planned for you is just go out there and do the best you can to be happy. That was tricky, but you know what? That's how they do it all the time. That's, that's, and that's my point. It was tricky. And I'm sorry to deceive you, but my point is to bring a point across. We can be that easily deceived. The thing is, there's people, in it, and I'm not trying to boast of myself because I don't agree with it. There's people out there who believe in me that, that, here, that as a man. Now listen, I am a man of God, but I am still a man. You have to check for yourself what the Bible says. Don't just believe everything I say just because it came out of my mouth. Because there are false teachers. How do you know I'm not leading you astray? Not that I am, but how do you know? Because I said so. How do you know that what I'm teaching you is not a false teaching? Because, well, because you told me you're not. <laughs> We'll get to that. I'm gonna, I'm, let me get back here. But So what I read to you, I said, for the time will come when sound doctrine will be intolerable, causing hindrances on your way of life. But I will provide for you new teachers so that, listen, so that your salvation will not be hindered by your conviction. Uh -uh. That's what? No, that's not true. <laughs> Come on in. We're, we're having false teachings today. Ah, cool. <laughs> this is what I just said. I'm going to go through this one real slow with you guys. I will provide for you. This was supposed to be, this, this, what the real scripture is, is Paul speaking out of the inspiration of God, okay? And he's saying that I will provide for you new teachers so that your salvation will not be hindered by your convictions. And that is certainly what the world wants to believe today. 
that our convictions should not hinder our salvation. Therefore, we are golden. It doesn't matter if we get conviction in our heart. All we got to do is just harden our hearts to it and just keep walking in the way we want to walk, and we're doing okay, right? But that's not what the Bible teaches. However, there are teachers that will tickle your ears with this. Now I'm going to read to you what the scripture actually says. Second Timothy chapter 4, chapter 4, beginning with verse 3. In verse 3, this is what the scripture actually says. No, no kidding, no lie. This is what it really says, okay? For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. You see how I twisted that around? But it sounded right, right? For, for I mean, if you really weren't paying real close attention and lining it up with the Bible yourself, it sounded like it could be scripture. It sounded a little familiar, but there was a little twist in it. And that's what I wanted to, to, to show you guys is just how easy it really can be to see. Don't feel bad, Jenny, don't feel bad, because this th th that was designed to do exactly that, was to, to trick you a little bit. So don't, okay. No. No, you're right, but listen to me. Okay. No, what I read is actually the opposite of what the scripture says. You said they provide Provide for you new teachers so that your salvation won't be hindered by your convictions. That's not true. Right. All right. But in the scripture, it actually says the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. And I want you guys to listen to me. The time that will come has now come. Trust me on this. The time that has come will is now has now come. It's here. Okay. People do not tolerate sound doctrine anymore today. There is no more toleration of sound doctrine. Matter of fact, if you tolerate sound doctrine, you are now considered intolerable. And you're hateful and you're judgmental. Oh yeah. If you speak of the promised tribulation in scripture or the prophecies that are all over scripture, if you speak of those, you're considered hateful. You're considered, uh, hold on, let me get back to where I was here. You're considered a conspiracy theorist. That's what I'm looking for. You start talking about the end days. You start talking about the return of Christ. You start talking about prophecies. You start talking about prophets like Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah. You in this world will be called a conspiracy theorist. If you stand up for the truth and you don't sway from the true word of God, you're considered intolerant and hateful. If you call something what it actually is, <laughs> We've seen a lot of that today. You call something what it actually is, according to what Scripture says it actually is. You're judgmental now. Who called you? A, who called you to be a judge? If you teach on tithing and giving, if a pastor preaches a sermon and he talks about the the generosity of the church, which Paul did numerous times in his letters, but if a pastor does that today, now they're considered money hungry. They're considered uh, out to, to to get the church for money. They're greedy. Thank you, sir. Good. Is oh, that? I'll start it. First thing. <laughs> well, I'm not saying there's not some greedy ones. I'm just saying it's got to the point now where the truth, the scripture, is considered entirely. Let me go to 1 Corinthians, not right now, but check out 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul talked a lot about how the church was supposed to provide for the church. You go into the book of Acts, he talked, it, was, it says a lot about that in the book of Acts. Paul didn't make, look at, about 25% of what Jesus talked about was the giving of the church. It was about money, 25%. But if you touch on any of those scriptures anymore, now all of a sudden, oh, he's one of the greedy preachers. He's one of those preachers that's just money hungry. Hey, 
Here's one of my favorite ones. If you believe and teach that there is only one way to the Father, the world considers you a bigot. Oh, how I have been called a bigot a lot lately. I'm a bigot. <laughs> I am just full of bigotry because I believe that the Bible actually says, matter of fact, because I know that the Bible actually says there is only one way to the Father. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And nobody will come to the Father except by me. Mm -hmm. So call me a bigot, but let me tell you, there, there's an amen, Jimmy. Amen. <laughs> I'm not doing any more lying today, I promise. <laughs> All right. The problem with all of these that I just listed to you is what happens is when you do stand on the Word of God and you don't sway from it and you do believe what the Bible says and you search the scriptures through and through and you pray and you let the Holy Spirit show you discernment and uh, you, you do exactly what, the, what, what God is calling you to do. You see, Speak of the, you know, the thing about the tribulation and the end times, people want to stray from that because you don't want to be called a conspiracy theorist. But Jesus told you to look for the signs. He gave you signs and said, look for them. Matter of fact, he called you a fool if you couldn't tell the signs. All the signs in the sky. Look at all the signs. This, absolutely. A lot of the stuff. Go to Matthew 24. Go into, I mean, there's just pretty amazing. But my, my point is that what happens in the church today is we've gotten so sensitive that we don't want to be called a bigot. So we tend to make, well, there's probably, you know, several paths to get to heaven. This is just the way that I've chosen. I've heard it. You, you, you start hearing things like, well, you know, I, I know that Jesus said I'm the only way, but I'm sure that because Jesus is God, he can provide other ways too. That's not, that's not nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, there is many ways to Jesus. Amen. That's cool. So what happens is that you, you start to stand on the word of God and you start to get backed off by people. You start to be called intolerant. Oh, you're one of those intolerant bigots that believe every word of the Bible. And so people get their feelings hurt or they get persuaded by the world and so they start to falter a little bit. And what happens is it becomes uncomfortable to live out the truth. Let's be honest. It can be uncomfortable at times to live out the truth. And when people grow uncomfortable, what happens is they start looking for people who will teach them what they want to hear. They start te looking for people who are going to be a little more tolerant with their way of life, their chosen way of life, with their decisions. Now, what I love about our family here is we are truly a come as you are church, but we're also a leave as you were not church. <laughs> you come as you are, you don't leave the same way. Amen? Amen. But people will grow uncomfortable, and so they'll start looking for these teachers who will tell them what they want to hear and make things a little more comfortable for their lifestyle. But that's exactly what Paul was warning Timothy about here. He says the time will come when they won't tolerate the sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they'll multiply teachers for themselves because they want to have their ears tickled a little bit. And you know, there is a whole lot more people out there with feathers than there is those standing on the Word of God. Ready to tickle your ear. Not ready to minister to you or save your soul, but ready to tickle your ear and tell you what you want to hear because they want to fill their church up. They want to do whatever. They want to be on TV. They, whatever the case is, I don't know. I, I don't want to know. But there are, there are those who are doing this. So my question now is, because everybody's thinking, well, how, how then are we ever going to recognize the truth? And my wife back there throwing chairs on me. <laughs> There's a <laughs> All right, so how are we ever going to recognize the truth? John actually wrote this. He said, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
Test the spirits. Don't just believe everything you hear. Don't just believe every teaching that comes across. Just because I'm up here and I start to teach something, just don't believe it. Look it in the Bible. Find it. Look it up. Try to prove that what I'm saying is right. Test every spirit. Don't believe every spirit, but test them and determine. Determine. Discern and determine whether they are from God or not. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. Jesus himself said that false messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. That was in Matthew 24. <coughs> Those who remember their Bibles today, bring, go to 2 Corinthians. I'm just kidding. Go to 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. Second Corinthians, chapter 11. Yep, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to start in verse 3. Paul writes, But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a complete and pure devotion to Christ. For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we did not preach, or you receive a different spirit, which you had not received, or a different gospel, which you had not accepted, you put up with it splendidly enough. Paul saying that I fear that just like as the serpent deceived me, that you also are going to be deceived, that you're going to be deceived and pulled away from pure devotion to Christ, and you're going to put up with it. Why are you going to put up with it? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, because you were not wise enough to look the teaching up yourself, or two, it sounded like something you really desire, so you decided I'm gonna go with it. And so what happens is you become deceived and you, and you become pulled from a pure uh, devotion to our Lord and Savior. Go to uh, verse 13, same chapter, verse 13. Says, for such people are false apostles deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no great thing if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Now listen to what he just said. Some are going to disguise themselves as apostles of Christ, so not everybody who says or not everybody who's teaching falsely is going to necessarily just say that Christ is not the Son of God. But they disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. And they will twist scriptures around. And they'll start teaching things that are unbiblical. And they'll start removing word of God, the Word of God from the Word of God. They'll start removing things from the Bible. Start adding things in. Let me tell you, if this is the case and we are not checking the scriptures ourselves, we will be deceived. Look, if you're not in the Bible yourself, you're already deceived. There's some truth for you. If you are coming to church on Sunday and getting fed by whoever's up here preaching the message, and the rest of your week, you are not in the Bible at all. You're not getting into the scriptures. You're not getting the word of God, which is your instruction manual for life as a Christian. You've already been deceived, believing that you don't need your daily bread. You've been deceived. We need our daily bread. We have to live on our daily bread on a daily basis. You cannot survive all week long by the piece of bread that was given to you today. What the bread you've been given today is for today. Tomorrow you're going to need new bread for tomorrow. Because there's going to be more laid on your plate tomorrow. And there's going to be more things put in your way. And you're going to face more demons and more persecution. And you're going to face all these different trials tomorrow. That today's bread is not going to be sufficient for you. You'll need tomorrow's bread tomorrow. It's like the body needs food every day. It does. Right? Imagine if you get a piece of bread, raisin bread today, you try to eat that thing a week from now, that stale, nasty, moldy raisin bread. It ain't going to do you no good, man. All right, let's go to, I'm going to hit some scriptures with you guys. Go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1.
and verse 20. Peter writes, first of all, first of all, you should know this. No prophecy of scripture comes from one's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Let me say this one more time. First of all, you should know this. He's talking to all of us. First of all, you should know this. No prophecy that is in the scripture, no prophecy of scripture, comes from one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It also says in 2 Timothy that all scripture is inspired by God or is God breathed. All scripture is from God. Yes, men were the authors, but men were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the words of God, to write what God's will was. They were moved and inspired by God. And then going to chapter 2, after he tells us that every prophet in the scriptures are of God, then he goes on and says, but there were also false prophets among the people just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who, brought, who bought them, and will bring swift destruction on themselves. And then he says, many will follow their unrestrained ways by the way of truth will be blasphemed because of them. They will exploit you in their greed and deceptive words. Their condemnation pronounced long ago is not idle, and their destruction does not sleep. So what is Peter saying? He's saying, listen, when you read of the prophets in Scripture, know that they were inspired by God. They are the word of God, okay? He says, but there was also false prophets back in those days. There was people that were teaching things that was not inspired by God, but was inspired by Baal, or by, by the devil, by their own greed, their own desires. There were some prophets that were prophesying not by God. And he says, and just as there was false prophets back in the day trying to lead the people astray, there's going to be false teachers amongst you today that will do everything in their power to lead the elect astray, to lead you, to deceive you, and lead you astray. One of my favorite prophets that Peter's speaking about here is the prophet Jeremiah. I love the prophet Jeremiah because he had a hard job, man. Jer Jeremiah, would be known as the weeping prophet. His whole life stuff. Was that? His whole life stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Man. And, and, but, they, but what a heart for God. He would stand before the people and call these false prophets out and tell them that, that, these false, that God did not send these teachers, that you're being deceived, you're being led astray, you're being tricked. You're being lied to. And he would stand in, in, at the gate and he would tell them, if you're going to come in, don't come in and say that because, because we have mercy from God that we can continue living the way we were before. He says, that's not going to work. This is in Jeremiah chapter 7. He's saying that, that don't, let, don't come in here thinking that because you come to church on Sunday that you're saved, that everything's great, everything's going to be good, and you can go back to doing life the way you used to do it. <laughs> Listen, there's people in the church today that think the same way. You really believe that if you come to church, well, I'm a member of a church. Well, good. Are you a member of heaven? Because they're not the same. It doesn't matter that you come to church. Are you saved? Have you given your life to Christ? Are you being transformed by the Word of God? I'm going to tell you the truth. If you're not in the Word of God, I highly doubt you're being transformed by it. But there's a lot of people in church today that are in church but not in the Bible, not in the Word of God, not in the instructions that God's given us. And I fear for you. I feel like Jeremiah, the weeping prophet sometimes, because sometimes people don't get it, just like they didn't get it in Jeremiah's day. I want to read from Jeremiah in chapter 23. <clears throat> 
23, I'll start with verse 9. He says, concerning the prophets. It's right there. My heart is broken within me, and all my bones tremble. I've become like a drunkard, like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord, because of his holy words. For the land is full of adulterers. The land mourns because of the curse, and the grazing lands in the wilderness have dried up. Their way of life has become evil, and their power is not rightly used, because both prophet and priest are ungodly. In my house I have found their evil. That's fearful, man. Go to verse 16. He says, this is what the Lord of hosts says. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They're making you worthless. Oh, that's what false teachers do today. Same exact thing. He says, don't listen to this. This is Jeremiah now speaking to the people. He says, don't listen to them. These prophets that are saying to you, peace, peace, when there is no peace. He says, don't listen to them because they are making you worthless. Listen, if a false teacher is putting something out there and you have not discerned it by getting into the Word of God and lining it up with a the teaching, then they are making you worthless when you believe it and when you begin to walk in a false teaching. He goes, they speak visions from their own minds, not from the Lord's mouth. They keep on saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said you will have peace. They have said to everyone who follows their stubbornness of his heart that no harm will come to you. And I'm going to tell you, there are false prophets out there today saying the exact same thing. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And that you can continue doing the same things. You don't have to be transformed. You don't have to be affected by the word of God. You said a sinner's prayer last Sunday. You're saved. You're going to heaven. Go have fun the rest of your life. And no harm will come to you. It's not true. Verse 25. I have heard... What the prophets who prophesy a lie in my name have said. I had a dream. I had a dream. How long? He asks. Will this continue in the minds of the prophets prophesying lies? Prophets of the deceit of their own minds. Through their dreams that they tell one another. They plan to cause my people to forget my name. Wow. They plan to cause, God says, they plan to cause my people to forget my name by stealing the word of God from each other. Just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship, the prophet who has only a dream should recount the dream, but the one who has, listen now, but the one who has my word should speak my word truthfully. No matter what the world says to you. No matter what the persecutors say about you. No matter what the teachers say about you. He says the one who has my word should speak my word truthfully. In other words, stand true on the word of God. Do not sway back and forth on it. Speak the truth. Trust in God, not in yourself, nor those of the world. And it won't be comfortable. It's not comfortable. Trust me, it is not comfortable. I've had several people, as of recently, come against me because I speak the truth of the Word of God. Because I won't tickle their ears. Because I won't back down from what God's Word says. But I don't care how many times you try and try, you can't rewrite God's Word. It stated it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not change, no matter how much you want him to. But when you speak it, the people don't want to hear that. No, no, Pastor Rob, tell me something good. <laughs> yeah, throw some sugar on it for me. I want to feel good when I leave church. Listen, to be honest with you, you start applying the word of God, you'll feel better than you ever have, but you will also be persecuted. 
you'll feel conviction. Listen, when conviction comes, it's not to make you feel horrible about yourself. It's to bring you to a point of repentance. There's a purpose for that conviction. And then when you repent of that, truly repent, and turn from that sin, anything that's left is that guilt that comes from the enemy. Because God will forgive when you truly confess and repent, no matter what your sin. Listen to what else he says. The prophet who has only a dream should recount the dream, but the one who has my word should speak my word truthfully. For what is straw compared to grain? I love that analogy. This is the Lord's declaration. Is not my word like fire? This is the Lord's declaration. And like a hammer that pulverizes rock. Therefore, take note, I am against the prophets. The Lord's declaration, who steal my works from each other. I am against the prophets. The Lord's declaration, who use their own tongues to make a declaration. I am against those who prophesy false dreams, telling them and leading my people astray with their falsehoods and their boasting. It was not I who sent or commanded them, and they are of no benefit at all to these people. You really want to test every spirit. Because there's a lot of spirits out there that are of no benefit to the people. There is a lot of teachings out there, a lot of false prophets, a lot of deceiving spirits out there that are taking the word of God from the people just as they were in the days of Jeremiah the prophet. So like I said, there's far too many people today that are being deceived. And how do you know? Nobody wants to admit that they believe in false teachings. How do you know that you're not being deceived? Like I said, there are many people that come to church and live off the little bit that Pastor Rob feeds them. And I'm going to tell you the truth, you're living on an extremely dangerous diet. Very limited diet. You need more than what you get here in an hour or two on Sunday. And it's great that we have Bible study on Wednesdays now. Come to the Bible study. Trust me, I, I can't be here because of my work schedule, but I get with Dan every week. I know what he's bringing to teach. I, Dan himself has to come to me and say, this is what I'm teaching. These are the scriptures I'm using. And I will look up the scriptures and I will talk to him about what he's teaching. To ensure there is no deceptive spirit trying to deceive you. But you should come and learn. Come and get fed. Just to touch the surface of many of the false teachings, because <laughs> there's a lot of them. But let's touch the surface on a few of them. One is God will not judge you because you've accepted Jesus into your heart. That's what that's pretty much what Jeremiah was saying when he said, "You guys are saying peace, peace when there is no peace." All right. There's a false teaching out there that says, "Well." Because you've accepted Jesus into your heart, you won't be judged. Listen, we will all stand before the judgment throne of Christ. Every one of us. What's that? Judgment begins in the house of yes, in the house of the Lord. Absolutely, judgment begins. So that right there is just very foolish teaching. But there are many who believe that. There are many who believe that all you have to do is accept Jesus into your heart, because they were told that when you were at Sunday school one day as a kid. You just accept Jesus in your heart, and no matter what happens, you're going to be okay, everything's right. Listen, the Bible never once says to accept Jesus in your heart. Oh, not in a single place in the Bible does it say that you should accept Jesus in your heart. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to repeat the sinner's prayer after me. There is no sinner's prayer in the Bible. I, I know that some of you guys are kind of might be shocked by this, but I want to tell you the truth. 
That's, that's how dangerous these false teachings are. Is there may be teachings that we've heard since we were little kids. And so we, we prescribe them as doctrine when they're not doctrine. They're man-made ideologies or man-made lies. Now listen, the, the sinner's prayer, I'm going to tell you that the idea of the sinner's prayer, I, I can agree with most of the idea, but this whole re repeat this prayer for me, well, if you just repeat a prayer for me, you ain't praying for my heart. Not really. And so how, are you, how is there going to be some type of transformation from death to life through you repeating the words that I told you to say? salvation real simple and easy so that everyone can get it. But, but the point of it is it to, to get down humble yourselves by getting down on your knees before a holy God and admitting that you are a wretched person who has done horrible things in life. You're a sinner and you truly need salvation. You truly need to save. That's why I say I, I agree with what the, the sinner's prayer means, but I don't agree with repeat this prayer for me and you are going to heaven and everything's going to be great. It's a prayer is a sincere desire of your heart. A prayer is a sincere desire of your heart. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's one of the false teachings that are out there that God will not judge you because you've accepted Jesus into your heart. Another one is that repentance and transformation are not necessary because we're saved by faith alone. It is wrong. These are all false teachings. Um, but but that's what people are being taught today. Well, we're saved by grace through faith and therefore not by works, so no works have to happen. Well, let me tell you what James said. James said, show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Yeah. James spoke about Abraham and how Abraham was saved by faith. Yeah. But if Abraham decided not to take his son up on the mountain, could he really turn to God and say, but I still believe you and been saved? No. His works had to show his faith. Imagine if, if God had told Abraham to take his son up on the mountain and sacrifice him and Abraham just said, well, that's just a little too much. That's too hard for me. I can't do that. But I love you, God. I believe in you. I trust you. But I can't do that. Then you don't really trust him, do you? <laughs> that's, that's what James was saying. It's, it is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone that we're saved. But our faith is proven by our actions. Our faith is proven by our transformation. Our faith is dead without works. Another false teaching is that God forgives you even if you can't, and I said can't, even if you can't repent. The reason for this new false teaching is because many people believe that a lifestyle they were born into and therefore they can't repent because it's who they are. There is no sin that you can't repent from. Here's some truth for you. I don't care what the sin is because I've done it all. You think of it, you name it, I've done it. Jesus can set you free and deliver you from anything that hinders you from being in relation to his father. Confession and repentance is necessary. Okay? If somebody tells you otherwise, 
let me tell you that that's probably one of those guys who's walking around with a stamp on their head saying false teacher. Those are the ones that are easy to recognize. If they tell you that you're okay when and whatever you're doing and there's no need for repentance, it, it, that's false teaching. Confession and repentance. Jesus died to set us free from our sin, not so that we can continue in it. Amen? Amen. Come on, guys. Wake up. Amen. That was the first thing that Peter said to him. Brothers, what do we do? The very first word out of his mouth was repent. Exactly. Well, you know, you think not, of... Not, not, okay. Repeat after me. <laughs> you see Peter pulled that out of his back pocket of his robe. <laughs> Amen. John the Baptist came preaching repent for the kingdom of God is near. Jesus Christ himself came preaching repent for the kingdom of God is near. Repentance is necessary. It has to happen. And Jesus can set you free from any bondage. If you're struggling with something right now, I can make you a promise. If you're struggling with sin right now, Jesus Christ can set you free from whatever that bondage is. Trust me. Trust me this is true. Because like you said, you name it and I've done it. And I have been set free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. The other teaching... We must not judge. I might get I might get some persecution on this one. But that's all right. We're not to judge. We must not judge. We should never judge. Judge and lead. Judge lest you are judge not lest you be judged yourself. Man, how everybody in the world knows that one little scripture. I'll way out of context and forgets that there's a whole bunch of scriptures before and after that one too. Listen to me now. Because this is not to say that you should be out there judging everybody. You, you doggone shouldn't, okay? As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He said that it is not for us to judge those outside the church because those outside the church are acting just as those outside the church are expected to be acting. But is it not for you to judge inside? To keep your brother and sister accountable? Yeah. Out of love. How could you truly say that you love your brother and sister if you don't say anything when you see them falling off course? How can you truly say that you love your brother or sister if you see them indulging in something dangerous to their health, dangerous to their spirituality, dangerous to their walk, and you love them by not saying anything? I think that's called hatred. If I was if I was get, digging into something that you guys know I shouldn't be getting into, if I was falling short, if I was out there doing the stuff I used to do, I won't name names because we got kids in here now, but some things that I used to do, if, if you knew that I was doing it, can you really say you love me if you allowed me to continue doing it without saying something to me? I, I, I got no. I just want you to look at you, Bubba, because Bubba just gonna slap me upside the head like he used to. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it too. And he would. The same return. Absolutely. He, 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 you, you guys were supposed to judge inside the church. That's how we edify the body of Christ. It's how we build up the body of Christ. Now look at when we judge inside the church. It's not to destroy. It's to build up. It's not to build down, it's to edify, it's to build up the body of Christ. It's to keep each other accountable. We need accountability. But boy, I love how everybody and their mama knows, judge not lest you be judged yourselves. <laughs> we'll get into that scripture one day. <laughs> Yeah. Not a believer says scriptures are wrong, and then I'll cite that and I say, but if you don't believe the word, then no, well, you can't say scriptures are wrong. <laughs> well, all the scriptures are wrong except that one. <laughs> all right, another teaching. God will never give you more than you can handle. Look at that. The whole church said it with me. We've all heard that one, haven't we? God will never give you more than you can handle. Excuse my language. Bull crap. That's just not true at all, man. 
You know where people get this, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 1 Corinthians, but I could be 2 Corinthians. But where people are getting this is the scripture says, God will not allow the temptation to be more than you can withstand, but will show you a way out. But listen, God will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand does not say God will never give you more than you can handle. God is going to give you more than you Look, if God never gave you more than you can handle, why in the world would you need God? Right. Right? Think of, and I know we've talked about some of this before, but that's okay. Some of you haven't been here. We got all night, so. Um, think of, think of uh, Gideon. You want to talk about God giving somebody more they can handle? God called Gideon, who was the weakest of the smallest family, or no, the youngest of the weakest family in the land at the time. Okay, the youngest of the weakest family, and God called him to be a warrior. He said that he was going to lead people to war. All right, and not only was he going to lead them to war, but he was going to take about 32,000 men and go up to war against 130,000 men. Now, my, I didn't look this up by going off of the spirit, so I, I might get the numbers not exact, but listen, 32,000 untrained men fighting against 130,000 trained soldiers. God gave him what he could handle. So then, as they're getting ready to go, God says, now oh, wait a minute, you've got too many men, Gideon. Now listen, because this dude's 100 grand short. And now God's saying, you've got too many. You need to cut it down some. Well, Gideon trusts God, so he cuts it down to about 10,000 men. Now Gideon's going to war with 10,000 men up against 132,000 strong. 130,000 strong. And God stops him and says, whoa, whoa, whoa. you got too many men. Say He'll cut it down. What'd you say? He cut it down to like 300. 300. 300. That was Gideon cut it down to 300 men and went to war against 130,000. And someone got the nerve to tell me God won't give you more than you can handle. <laughs> what warrior is he, he thinks you're superwoman? No, he just knows you've got a super God. Amen. Exactly. That's what I love about the story with Gideon is that when Gideon went to war with only 300, he fought against 130,000 men. Gideon, now, God won that battle. Gideon didn't win. God won. But listen, had Gideon said, God, you're crazy. I've only got 32,000 men. There's no way we've got so many. And they went to war with 32,000, they would have lost. God will give you more than you can handle. You think David could have handled a nine foot some giant by himself? No, he said, I, you come against me with spirit javelin, but I come against you in the name of my God. And he won that battle. God will give you more than you can handle because if he didn't, you would never learn to depend on God. Miss Superwoman over here. He doesn't think you're Superwoman. He knows you ain't Superwoman. He wants you to depend on his strength, not yours. It is. It is a tough one. Here's a good one. God is love and will never send people to hell. Mm. You gonna tell me you haven't heard that? <laughs> Here's the thing, you guys. Many people believe in heaven. Very few believe in hell. Many people believe in God and very few believe in the devil. But listen, if you truly believe in God, if you truly believe in heaven, you have to believe in hell and an enemy. You have to because he tells us about it. Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. Exactly. God is fully love. That part, they get right. God is love and he's full of love. He is love. He's also just. God is merciful, but he's also fully wrath. And being a just God, it means that he cannot 
make an excuse for your sin. There has to be a price paid. And so he paid it. So yes, God is love, but God is also just. God is merciful and he is also wrath. God has perfectly balanced scales. But with all these false teachings, you will never be able to discern these things as long as you're living off every wind of teaching. As long as you're feeding on another man's thoughts, instead of exploring the word for yourselves, you will continue to be deceived. Matter of fact, like scripture says, you must test every spirit. You must test, test the teachings that are going out there and you must test the motives. God knows our hearts. That's another one I hear a lot of. Well, that's okay. I, I know I keep doing this, but God knows my heart. <laughs> yeah, he says it's wicked above all things and deceitful. He knows the intentions of our hearts as well. Um, got it. Hold this for me, will you? Don't write off it. And they're not really attached to anything. <laughs> and then what I want you to do, bro, you just can't and never, though. There's some directions on here. Read those directions and then walk over there above them and just don't get too close and personal, but whisper them directions in his ear, will you? Read them in his ear. Well, he's doing that. <laughs> no biting. In the book of Acts, chapter 17. Show him the can yet. Just read it to him. All right, Acts chapter 17 and verse 10. It says, As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Ber Berea. On arrival, they went into the synagogues of the Jews. The people there were more open minded than those in Thessalonica, since they welcomed the message with eagerness and examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. You see what, what they did here? They examined the scriptures daily. It says that, they, okay, so Paul went in and he was preaching about Jesus Christ and he was telling them how Jesus was this promised Messiah and how Jesus was exactly what God had warned us and told us about in the prophets in the Old Testament and the scriptures and how Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. And so instead of these people just taking that, 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 that teaching and running with it, they stopped themselves and they examined the scriptures to see if what they were hearing was the truth. If what they were hearing was real. Listen, brothers and sisters, we should do no different today. Don't trust it just because I said it. It has to be true. Examine it yourself. Get into the Word of God. We at Heaven's Highway are a church that believes fully in discipleship. All right? Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. We believe in discipleship, but as long as you guys are coming in and only getting fed a little bit today, and then receiving nothing more until next week, you cannot truly be discipled. My job is not to teach you everything the Bible says. My job is to minister what God's Word comes to me and show you how to get into the Word for yourselves and test every spirit and test every teaching and test every wind of doctrine against the truth of God's Word. I can't walk your walk for you. You have to walk your own walk. You're responsible. You must show yourselves approved. Not me. I love every one of you, but I cannot save you. I cannot get you into heaven. I cannot walk your walk of faith. I can tell you that I've been right where you guys have been. I can tell you that I've done some awful, horrible things in my life. I can tell you that I have not always been a Christian. I can tell you that I still fall from time to time, and I still slip up, and I still struggle today. 
I can tell you that everybody in Toledo is welcome to come to Heaven's Highway and hear some truth, but don't come in looking to get your ears tickled because I refuse to carry a feather around and stand strong in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. But I can't walk your life out for you. I can't walk your faith out for you. You are responsible to get into the Word. All right, you come in here, this is the meeting room, we get into the Word of God, we bring out the message, but when you leave here, I go home and I get into my Bible. For me. Do you? Because you need to. What do you do on Monday? Do you, do you wake up and do you pray to, for God to show you what he's got planned for the day and get into his word and let him lead you before you start the day? Or do you find yourself getting up and so busy that you have to run out the door with a cup of coffee spilling halfway across the room and get into your truck and go to work? And by the time you finally get into the word and do some prayer, you find yourself repenting. Instead of asking for a leadership, you're asking God to forgive you for what you've done all day because you didn't start the day out with God, but you try to end it with it. I want to tell you, I, I did that for a long time. I was so busy and caught up in my own life that God usually got my leftovers at the end of the day. And those leftovers always consisted of, Lord, I'm sorry I screwed up again today. When I finally realized that God has to come first and I get up in the morning and I would say my prayers and I love doing what I've suggested to some of you as I'll start my day out every day with a psalm and a proverb. There's 31 proverbs. There's usually 31 days in a month. That's the day that, that's the proverb I'll be on. And then I'll go through the entire psalms. I'll talk to Or about it, Melissa about it. You guys, I've made the suggestion and it's beautiful because when I start my day out with God, I usually end up praising him at the end of the day instead of asking for forgiveness for everything I messed up when I walked without him. In Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Hmm. The word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword. It probes, it probes into the deepest parts of a person. And it separates between bone and marrow, between soul and spirit. Well, that doesn't always feel good. But it can bring conviction. It brings repentance. It brings transformation. It reveals to a person both his ingrained wickedness and the saving way of faith. Both. We could, okay. <laughs> just just put, pass on down the line what, what he read to you. No, no, no. Just pass it. We're going to go from you to you to you to you. I was going to have you get up and walk over, but that's all right. Tell Sandy and she'll, she'll tell Geraldine, and Geraldine will tell Edie, and, and Edie will tell the world. You already forgot. You already forgot. okay, well, we are. Good. It my point. All right, we just, just, just kind of put it together, what you got out of it, though. What you thought he said. Oh. <laughs> it's all in fun, man. It's just an experiment. It's just an experiment. All right. Well, he's doing that. Keep it clean. Next, we're over in Acts. Go over to chapter 19, dude. This kind of gave me my last minute, but it really made an a impact on my dream at this time. In chapter 19. Yep, Acts 19 and then verse 13. It says, Then some of the inter, inter I can't even say this word, itinerant Jews, Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Wow. How would you feel if you thought you were going about the Father's work? And the spirit said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? I don't know you. 
Oh, man. That's deep, man, if you think about it, because honestly, we believe truly that we're going about the Father's work because we are now Christians in church. But if we're not digging into God's word, how are you ever hearing from him? How are you ever receiving from him? How are you ever learning about him? How are you ever transforming by him? If you're not into the word of God, and so you go about and you begin to do what you believe is the Father's work, and the demon says to you, whoa, 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 wait, I know Jesus, and I know these other people you hang out with, but who are you? I don't know you. And listen to what he says. Then the man who had the evil spirit leaped on them overpowered them all and prevailed against them. <clears throat> I hate to be that dude, man. Whooped him, yeah. He went out there thinking he was going about his father's business and he got whooped up by a demon. He stopped on, man, because he really didn't know Jesus. He said he was preaching in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches about. But he himself didn't know Jesus. The reason I touch on the scripture is because I want you all to make sure that you personally know Jesus. Because you cannot go out into that world and say, well, I know Jesus. I know the Jesus that, that Pastor Rob speaks about. And in the name of the Jesus that Pastor Rob preaches about, I command this evil. You're going to be overtaken. You're going to get stopped. Exactly. You have not the authority that it takes to come against these wicked demons and these evil teachings. And you don't have that authority if you do not have the authority of Christ yourself. Don't depend on my faith. You need your own faith. <laughs> Ignorance of the scriptures will not excuse you for being accountable to them. I believe that a lot of people don't want to get deep into the Word of God because they don't want to be accountable for what they're going to learn. But the ignorance of the Scriptures doesn't excuse you for being accountable. You will be accountable. Yeah, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. But yeah, sir. The, the word actually says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Ignorance is not an excuse. In Proverbs, I'm just going to go like this. I'm going to go through a couple Proverbs real quick because I want to show you how important it is for us to really receive and know God's word. So I'm going to go through this real quick. In Proverbs 1. 1 through 7, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, the king of Israel, for learning what wisdom and discipline are, for understanding insightful sayings, for receiving the instruction in righteousness, justice, and integrity, for teaching shrewdness to the inexperienced, knowledge and discretion to a young man. A wise man will listen and increase his learning and a discerning man will obtain guidance for understanding a proverb or a parable, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Mm. In chapter 2 or Proverbs 2 verse 1, my son if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, listening closely to wisdom and directing your heart to understanding. Furthermore, if you call out to insight and lift your voice to understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up success for the upright. He is a shield for those who live with integrity. In chapter 3, verse 1. My son, don't forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands. For they will bring you many days of full life and well-being. Never let loyalty and faithfulness leave you. Listen, tie them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find favor and high reward in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own understanding. Think about him, on him in all your ways and he will guide you on the right paths. 
Um, verse 13. Happy is a man who finds wisdom and who acquires understanding, for she is more profitable than silver, and her venue is better than gold. She is more precious than jewels. Nothing you desire compares with her. You, you, you getting all of this? I mean, what is he saying? He's pretty much just telling you this. If you want wisdom, you've got to cry out for it. If you want wisdom, God has the wisdom. It's in the Word. And if you're not in the Word, you can pretty much guarantee you're not going to get the wisdom. It's all in the Word of God. You are not going to grow if you're not getting into the Word of God for yourselves. I had a whole bunch of Proverbs, but, it, but it, I mean, I, I'm thinking you guys might be getting the point here. Yes. So how will you know what's expected of you if you're not in the Word of God? Exactly. You won't. You, you, you can call yourself a Christian all day long and call yourself a Christ follower all day long. But if you're not getting into the Word of God to, to glean from His own command and instruction, you're not going to know what's expected of you. You're not going to know how to deal with a brother who is hurting. You're not going to know how to deal with people in the church. You're not going to know how to deal with people outside the church, people in your family. You won't know how God instructs you to deal with situation, any given situation, if you're not getting into his instructions and letting him lead you through his word. I don't, I'm not saying this because I don't want you to call me because you, I love you guys and I love when you call me for suggestions, but <laughs> oftentimes I find it funny that people call me and say, well, what do I do in this situation? I, you know what I'm going to start telling you? Go look it up. It's in the Bible. Not that I don't want a guy to lead you, I certainly will. I just, I really want you guys to get this for yourselves because the truth is, as we're doing this right here, there's supposed to be people in this congregation right now who are supposed to be also being raised up as leaders in the church. There's people in here right now that are supposed to be raising up to go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's people in here right now that are called to be ministers of God. But as long as you're not getting into the Word of God and you're only surviving off the little bit that I give you on Sunday, then how will you ever receive or answer the call that God's put on your life? You have the, not only the right to know God, but you have the responsibility to know Him. Jesus himself warned of not knowing what to know the scriptures. Real quick, in Matthew chapter 22, I heard you guys chuckle when I said it. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 22, what's going on here is that um, the Sadducees were speaking about marriage in heaven, okay? We'll just make that real quick. And then, so in verse 29, it says, Jesus answered the Sadducees and he said, You are deceived because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Right from the mouth of the Lord. You are deceived because you don't know the scriptures. Do you want to make sure that you are not being deceived by false teaching? You need to know the scriptures. Uh, in Mark chapter 7. <coughs> hey, that one was real quick. I'm done with that one. Now I'm going to the next one. <laughs> In Mark chapter 7, verse 13, again, what's going on here is that um, they, they were making up excuses as to why they couldn't uh, give to their parents. And they were they basically are showing they were doing following these traditions and, and these traditions that were handed down, which, to be honest with you, there's a lot of those in the church today, traditions that are handed down from grandparents and from parents and talk to us. And we never really get into the Word of God to find the truth. We just believe the tradition. And that's what was going on here. So Jesus, he says, you revoke God's word by your tradition that you have that you have handed down. And you do many other similar things. So you see, that was real quick. It's the same thing today. You revoke God's word because of the traditions that were handed down, because of the teachings that were taught to you. 
just like we talked about what we're taught in, in, in Bible school when we were kids, eight years old, that you got to accept Jesus into your heart. And these are traditions that are handed down, and it's never searched in the Word, so we actually revoke God's Word by the traditions that we not only have received, but continue to pass down in order to deceive our own children. That scares me. That scares me that had I not seek God on my own and prayed and got into his word, I would have passed many deceitful traditions down to my own children. And I would have been the one to deceive my own children had I not gotten into the word myself. Anybody in here a parent? Take that home with you. You know this prophecy today that's being fulfilled right before our very eyes? There's prophecy being fulfilled in our own country, in our own government today that many of you guys don't even know about. Get in the prophets, man. Ezekiel. Daniel, whoa, Daniel will reveal us some things to you. Yeah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, you get in these prophets and you will see it all unfolding right before your very eyes. And the thing is this, when Jesus said when these times come and he's given us instruction, there's things that we are supposed to be doing in these times. Well, how are you ever going to know what those things are if you don't even realize we're in those times? Because you're not in the Word of God. You've got to get into the Word of God. Let God lead you to it. He'll show you what's going on in our very country today. He'll show you what's going on over in Russia and China. He'll show you what's going on in Iran. And He'll really show you what's going on in Israel today. And it'll show you how you are to respond to these things as a follower of Christ. If you get into his word, but we choose instead oftentimes to just come in and get a feel-good message out of church so we could get by the week and feel good about ourselves when prophecies being unfolded all across the world. <laughs> all right. So now, how far did it go? Do you? Or you got a question? No, we're sitting here waiting for you to say it. Pay attention. Okay, so, so what do these instructions say? They said it. No. <laughs> okay, okay, they Tear said it. Tear a piece off, dip it in, rub it to the polished. <laughs> Tear a piece off, dip it in, rub it till it's polished. <laughs> Sounds like she's buffing the top of your head. <laughs> Tear off a small portion of body and rub the surface until all dirt is removed. Finish the surface by buff buffing with a soft, dry cloth until a brilliant luster appears. I didn't hear you say any of that. <laughs> what I got from this group of people over here was tear a piece off, dip it, and rub it in. That's not even what you told me. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you guys getting this at all? Yeah. yeah. They don't call them that after the mouth. By the time this got to Gerilyn, this was all twisted around. Well, by the time we got the butler, it was all twisted around. <laughs> What I want you guys to get out is by the time this got passed on, huh? But that's my point. The point is if we're not reading the Word of God ourselves, you're going to follow anything somebody tells you. You're going to miss a whole lot of things. This is actually three paragraphs on here, and I got two sentences for me. Yeah, don't miss the lustrous shine. You're missing man. so much. <laughs> You're missing so much that God wants to show you today. So much that he wants to reveal to you because you're too busy to look at the directions yourself. And you're going to go off of what your neighbor has told you. 
and you're being deceived and you're being led astray and you're and you're missing so much out of here now so this says apparently if you put this if you do what you guys said what what you read this is supposed to make metal shine take through all the crud off of it shine it up make it like new again right Wait a minute. It's not, it's not shiny. You were sitting here reading this the whole time. No action. Wait a minute, you, okay. You were reading this the whole time and it's still not shining? Oh, oh. Say that again, nice smile. <laughs> you're exactly what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. I didn't ask you to follow the directions, just ask you to read them. I didn't ask you to follow the directions, I just asked you to read the directions. But doesn't it can say follow the directions? <laughs> <laughs> you get a hundred today, bro. <laughs> yeah, it does say that. <laughs> <laughs> James said this in the Bible, do not be hearers only, but be doers of the word of God. Amen. My brother sat here almost this whole sermon with the instructions in his hand and never applied it. And he's just as dull as it was when I gave it to him. The thing for you bikers, the only thing about never dull when you use it, it works. It shines you up, man. <coughs> Listen, for those of you who know anything about the Word of God, when you apply it, it works. It makes you new. Amen. It transforms your life. It shines you up. You are not going to be transformed because you come to Heaven's Highway every Sunday. That can be the beginning of a transformation, but only God can transform your life. Only God can bring you from death to life. And it will only happen when you apply the instructions in this book. I was really hoping you would sign this for me. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. Listen, it is inspired by God and it is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good word. The Word of God is not just there to read. It's to correct, to rebuke, to transform, to apply. It's to bring you from death to life, not just into eternal life, but so that you can be what God has purposed for you right here on earth. But you have to get into the instructions and you have to follow the directions. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you.